Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. to session 23 of Principles of Management course. I am your instructor Dr. Shikha N. Khera from Delhi School of Management, Delhi Technological University. We have been discussing students in previous sessions about motivation where we have completed the understanding of process of motivation and content theories of motivation. Today we shall be dealing with motivation session part 3 wherein we will discuss the various process theories of motivation. Let us see what are different process theories of motivation which includes equity theory, Virom's expectancy theory, Lawler's motivational model, goal setting, reinforcement, social cognitive attribution and control theory. Let us discuss these theories one after the other. So the first theory that is equity theory was given by Stacy Adam in 1965 where the essence of this theory is that people expect social justice in distribution of rewards. This distribution of rewards can be done by two ways that is procedural justice and distributive justice. Distributive justice means that there is fairness in distribution of the reward. Procedural justice is that the procedure to decide the distribution is fairly accounted for. So, according to this theory, job satisfaction and performance of employee depends upon the degree to which they perceive fairness and equity in their pay and promotion. So, if they perceive that their pay and promotion is being fairly given, then they have high job satisfaction and they have high performance. Level of equity of fairness in this is decided by employees by comparing their efforts and rewards with those of others. So, the, this theory states that people seek certain outcomes in exchange of their inputs or contribution. The input may refer to what? Input may refer to the effort the employee is giving, his experience, his knowledge, skill and intelligence and the outcome on the basis of the input would be the pay promotion that they get, benefits they get, propose, praise and recognition that they get from their superiors. So, this theory can have a simple expression here as we have discussed just now, people here focus on the rewards that received by them and the efforts that they have put in while they compare the reward that they have received by the other and the effort which is being put in by the other. So, it should not be that if two people are working as sales manager at the organization, they would be getting same rewards despite they are not putting in same efforts. So, this is the distributive justice for the manager. In such comparison, when ratios are found to be greater or lesser, the employee may perceive a state of injustice amongst them. So, for example, when a person with higher qualification and experience receives the same or less salary than another with lesser qualification and experience, the employee may perceive it as inequality. And I think students you must have, uh, have a good knowledge on when you feel unequal, what is the state of mind? The state of mind is non-performance. The person does not want to perform at all because he believes that my my efforts have not been acknowledged and generally the perception of such inequality may force or motivate a person to bring equity and restore the balance. Now individuals normally adopt any one or more of the methods to reduce their perceived inequality. How do they do so? First they may think of modifying the input to match the outcome. They feel that there is some equality that has taken place. Now in order to match up to that inequality, they would like for instance an underpaid employee is there. He feels that my effort is not acknowledged well and I am not getting the right output, I am not getting the right payment. So what he will do? He will decide to work less. Here he has matched the input with the outcome, less pay, so less effort. 
second is modifying the outcome to match the input now here they are modifying the outcome for what they are getting as the input so for instance here a less paid person may demand more pay for the job that he is doing so he is trying to match this demand that is more pay as outcome with the input that he is putting in third method is by which they can make the inequality work better is the distorting perception now in distorting perception what what happens when change in input or outcome is not possible like the first case or second case it's not possible then we go for the distorting perception in such cases people may tend to perceive the situation as per their convenience now for example here when there is no equality of rewards amongst the members an employee may distort the perceived reward of others to make it equal to his own reward example can be an overpaid employee may believe and justify his inputs you have to justify whatever you are getting because you are overpaid so you have to justify your inputs and are more than that your inputs are more than underpaid employee of the same cadre here you have distorted the perception of other individual despite that you are putting in same efforts but you are showcasing that uh, my efforts are better than the other employee the fourth scenario or the last option is that you should go or the employee may go for quitting to bring in equality because now it's enough for him he is not able to move on to the first two uh, first two stances also and he is not capable of distorting the perception so to bring equality in efforts and rewards he would put in his resignation and this resignation will play a major role in making the manager understand that what is not going on good in the job now how far this equity theory has been successful or what are the critical evaluations of it equity theory insists to insists on the need to treat people fairly and equally and has received wider approval amongst the managers it enables the managers to gain insight into employees perception about the pay and other benefits and it can bridge in a gap between the thought process of the manager and the employee that they are thinking in the same terms to motivate the employee well with respect to equity and fairness so the theory rightfully insist on manager should consider employee perception very seriously it highlights the importance of comparison in work situations and identification of reference persons there are certain weaknesses also of this equity theory and here researchers feel that it is difficult to practice equity theory because managers may not know exactly who the reference group of employees are for their input and outward outcome comparison so input output ratio as will differ with different individuals so identifying which is the right batch to be the role model batch is difficult and this theory has been questioned for assumption that overpayment of reward which is the outcome leads to the perception of inequality so this is because employees are rarely informed about their overpayment can we get to know that we are overpaid it's very difficult so moreover employees tend to change their perception of equality to justify their overpayment then comes victor virom's expectancy model this was given by victor virom victor virom in 1964 this theory is fundamentally based on certain assumptions like individuals join an organization with clear expectations of what their needs motives and environment is because if there is unclear expectation about their own needs and motivation they cannot fit into the expectancy model individual behavior is typically their conscious decision no influences are there individual seeks to fulfill different goals and needs through their organization and individuals like to choose among alternatives in order to optimize their outcome so these are the four premises on which victor virom expectancy motivation theory is based on this is written in the form of a formula where it says that motivation is when we get 
a resultant outcome of three variables and what are these three variables? Expectancy, instrumentality and valency. Let us first describe these three terms. Expectancy, it refers to the probability perceived by a person that applying that applying a given amount of effort will lead to specific level of performance. So, there is an expectation. If I study for one hour, I will be able to complete one chapter. So, that is given amount of work, amount of effort will lead to specific amount of performance. It indicates the confidence level of individual on the outcome that yes, if I study for one hour, I will be able to come up with one chapter answers well. High level of effort and persistence is usually the result of high expectancy because without effort you cannot conclude one chapter in one hour. So, an individual's capabilities and experiences, experience access to resources are major determinants here students for expectancy level. Because if you are not capable of reading for one hour continuously, your experience, previous experiences that you cannot memorize one chapter in one hour, one hour, so then your expectancy level will be differentiated. Second variable in Victor V. Rome's expectancy theory is instrumentality. It refers to individuals estimate or probability that a given level of achieved task or performance will lead to a particular outcome. So, probability is that I perceive that I can study, I have an estimation that I can learn in one hour one chapter that is instrumentality. If my perception is that I cannot then my instrumentality is 0. People would like to perform at high level only when they believe that such performances are ways and means of desired ends like monetary benefits, job security and promotion. This is what people want to have. So, thus if they know that the end to their outcome is these things then only they will put in effort. So, when an employee believes that a good performance will get him an increase in salary, the instrumentality will be of very high value because he knows that if I perform well, I will get promotion or salary. So, the instrument in between that is the probability or estimate of getting things are very high. There can be a situation where you know that despite putting in lot of efforts, you are not in a position to earn that promotion or salary. So, if in that situation occurs, your instrumentality is very weak, your estimation is very weak and when estimation is very weak, then the result is that you will not have your outcome as desired that is salary or promotion. So, in contrast if employee perceives no correlation between good performance and pay promotion then instrument instrumentality will be very low. Then comes valency, valency is the outcome. Now, what is outcome here when individual attaches high value to the outcome he would have greater motivation to perform. High value to outcome does not mean that high amount of money high value to outcome means if the outcome of the effort is for example, learning two chapters is the outcome of your effort and tomorrow is your exam and these two chapters are coming in that exam. Then what is the value of the outcome? Value of the outcome is very high. You are covering the syllabus for the exam which is uh, placed tomorrow in within the given timeline. So, that means it is going to be a very positive outcome or high value outcome. Motivation equation explains that tendency of person to act in a specific way depends on the strength of his expectation of outcomes or reward. Here the term strength of his expectations. So, in other words people are generally motivated when they think that they will be rewarded if they complete the task and such rewards for task are worth for the effort. Let me explain you this with the help of the diagram. Now, here the expectancy theory has three way relationships. What are the three way relationships? First relationship is between individual effort and individual performance which we call as effort relationship performance. The second relationship is between individual performance and organizational reward. So, this is performance reward relationship and the third one is reward and personal goal relationship. Let us try to understand this with the help of example. The very first one that is individual effort and individual 
performance. So, if I am your instructor for this paper, which I am actually, and I am telling you to memorize one whole book on principles of management in 24 hours. So, what is your performance going to be? Learning that book and what is the effort you have to put in in 24 hours? You know the amount of dedication, you may not sleep, you may not be able to eat. So, as a result that is the effort you have to put in. So, is there any parity between the two? The relationship between the effort and performance? So, you say that no ma'am, it cannot be done. No matter how much effort I put in, I cannot learn this whole book in 24 hours. So, then what it becomes? Then expectancy, which is the relationship between effort and performance, it becomes zero. Then comes to the second relationship that is individual performance and organizational rewards. So, here you feel that, okay, okay ma'am, I take up the challenge, I will read this and mug up this book whole in 24 hours, but you do not look like someone who will give me a reward for it. You announced me that I will give you 1 lakh rupees, but I do not think you are rich enough. You do not look like rich enough. So, I do not feel my organization has that much of financial health that he will, the organization will give me the rewards that they have mentioned to give for a particular effort. So, this is the valency. Valence, sorry, this is the second relationship that is performance reward relationship. Now, here performance reward relationship instrumentality will become 0. Because you say that, okay, I will mug up, but you do not look like someone who can give me this much reward. The third relationship is between reward and personal goal. So, I as a teacher announced initially that you read that book in 124 hours complete book, then the reward is rupees 1 lakh. So, you look into the reward, relationship between reward and personal goal and then you realize, oh my god, I have so many things to do out of this rupees 1 lakh. I can fulfill many of my personal goals out of rupees 1 lakh. So, that means the relationship between reward and personal goal is very high. So, then it becomes 1. So, this is how the equation works on the equation which we studied here. When expectancy is 1, instrumentality is 1 and valency is 1, it is a very high motivation for a person to take up that charge. But in the example which I mentioned, expectancy is not good, it is 0 because it is difficult to mug up that book, instrumentality is 0 because I do not look like someone who can give you the reward, but valency is 1 because it can fulfill lot of your goals. Newsom then later on identified 9 C's as important for expectancy theory and what are these 9 C's? They included challenges in the work, criteria for the work, compensation, capability, confidence, credibility, consistency, cost and communication. So, they are the important factors when we go for expectancy theory. If these factors fall in line, then there is higher chances that motivation of the employee is quite high. Let us evaluate Victor Virom's theory of motivation. So, the strength of this theory is that it provides a process of cognitive variables that disclose the individual difference in work motivation. And the assumption of this theory is that employees are rational people whose decisions are guided by perceptions and probability of estimates make it significantly different from other theories. However, the major limitation of this theory is that this practice by this practice people rarely make decision in such calculating and complex manner. So, decision making is very complex. And this theory has also been questioned for its claim that people are highly rational and objective in deciding what they will be going ahead with, which task they will take up and which task they will not take up. After this, the next theory is Porter Lawler's motivational model. It was given in 1968 by Porter and Lawler which is a complete model for motivation. This theory is based on or you can say in addition to expectancy model developed by Victor Verome, this, this theory is based on that model only and authors of this model have established a different kind of relationship between employee satisfaction and performance based on Verome's expectancy model. 
So, according to this model, when rewards are available to an individual in a sufficient value, then he will exert high level of performance that will lead to satisfaction. So, against this, earlier the notion was that satisfaction leads to high level of performance. This was the previous view, high performance. But this says that, Victor Viron's theory says that reward will lead to, reward will motivate employee to perform higher, which eventually will lead to high satisfaction from job. So, this is the depiction of this theory which mentions that employee has to put in effort and this effort, amount of effort, the energy spent to do task put in by a person in the job, it will depend on the perception of likely rewards. So, there is a relationship, it is a dependence from the work and the probability of getting such rewards and perceived energy levels required for performance of that job. Further, the actual performance, accomplishment of task which is the actual performance in the job is actually influenced by individuals long term characteristics like his own traits. Is he a person who uh, values his words and completes the task in the given time frame? Is he achievement oriented? So, these things will affect the actual performance and also abilities of the individuals and traits by his or her role perception, the type of efforts required for effective job performance. So, actual performance in turn leads to rewards. These rewards can be both extrinsic and intrinsic. Positive feeling, satisfaction and sense of achievement experienced by a person are what are intrinsic rewards and pay raise, better working condition and improved status are the extrinsic rewards. And when the reward for performance is seen as fair and equitable by the individual, then he is highly satisfied. So, this perception is seen when there is distributive and procedural justice in giving the rewards to the employee. Here I think students you must have now understood that what Victor Virom has tried to explain us is that the actual performance is dependent on the effort as expectancy theory of Victor Virom was. But Portal Lawler has added on these two rewards extrinsic and intrinsic reward to it. Portal Lawler has also added on these moderating variables of long term characteristic traits and role perception and also has added on the perceived effort for reward probability. And once the employee is satisfied, the value of reward plays an important role here. The extent of satisfaction experienced by individual tends to influence the future value of reward for the performance. If you are satisfied with reward for the first time, okay, you gave an answer in the class, your teacher gave you one Cadbury chocolate. So, that is the reward you got. So, what if you like the reward, what will you do? You will be satisfied with it and you will perform better. Maybe you think of answering two answers, two questions in the next session. But if that Cadbury chocolate is not of your if that Cadbury chocolate is not of your interest, then probably you will not be valuing that reward and maybe you, will, you may not think of coming up with the same performance next time. So, based on the extent to which performance leads to rewards, the perceived effort and reward probability is increased. The past performance or accomplishment of an individual can influence his or her perception relating to effort, effort reward and effort reward probability because if past experience is negative, people will not put in effort. If past performance or past experience is positive, then people will put in effort to get the reward. So, for 
this theory suggests then to make motivational rewards, uh, motivational programs more effective and result oriented, what manager has to do. So, you have to know, now that you know the concept of the theory, as a future budding manager, you should know what you have to do. You have to recognize the individual differences amongst the employees, the ones who have the uh, role perceptions or perceptions about the effort to be done, how they differentiate with each other match the people to the job that is right job for right people then only they will be motivated to perform that job and then finally utilize appropriate specific and time bound goals and make people believe that their goals are achievable also ensure that the rewards are individual specific and performance oriented if you give these terms and conditions or if you provide these necessities to the individuals then possibility is the individual is motivated you need to make the employee perceive that the system of reward is highly fair and make people believe that organization has genuine concern towards well-being and growth of the employees and also give necessary importance to non-monetary motivations such as recognition and appreciation believe me students a pat on the back, an appreciation in the group by the manager plays a major role than even some kind of monetary rewards. Now, let us evaluate this Porter Lawler motivation model, which is considered to be a complete model of motivation and it motivate it moves beyond the narrow concept of motivation force to wider concept of performance as a whole. In fact, this is the first model that has directly studied the relationship between satisfaction and performance. The version of Virom, Lawler are found to be valid in several testing zone in the real time organizations. But there are certain weaknesses of portal model, motivational model. It is viewed as more complex motivational theory than most other theories of motivation. Similar to Virom's expectancy model, this model also criticized on the ground that people may not incline to undertake a cumbersome exercise to make the decisions. So, let us now move on to the next theory of process theory that is goal setting theory. Goal setting theory students is a very prominent theory in uh, making a person's intention work towards the goal. Here the quality of goal decides how far the individual is motivated. It was given by Edwin and Gary in 1968 and the simple premise of this theory is that person's intention to work towards a goal is important source of motivation. So, the steps in goal setting theory include first the setting of goals, getting goal commitment and providing support elements to reach to the goal. What are the support elements like resources, action plans and feedback. So, according to this theory, managers can increase the motivation level of employees through specific tough goals that are acceptable to the employees and managers then provide regular and timely feedback also on the performance of the employees so that they know they are on a right track for attainment of the performance. So, Locke identified four parts for goal setting theory and what are the four parts? It's first is goal specificity where goals are highly specific, clear and um, unambiguous. You know the qualities of goal of clear, specific and unambiguous motivates the individual manager to move ahead because he knows there is no ambiguity, I am very clear the, about the path where I have to move. So, example here is visit your customer once a week, that is the goal a manager can give to the subordinates and then saying do your, if you say do your best, this is not a specific goal visit your customer once a week is a specific goal. Goal difficulty, so hard and amb ambitious goals are capable of providing more motivation to people than the easy goal because easy goal will not give any kind of spark in the mind or push to the mind to move ahead. The mem members or employees may take easy goals very lightly. So, this is because goals do not present any challenge. So, tough but achievable goals are required by the employees to stretch their 
limits stretch their limits in terms of talents and skills then comes we have defined the goal we have identified the level of difficulty of the goal the third step of goal setting theory focuses on goal acceptance so prior to allocating any tough or challenging goal we need to see the readiness of the manager and the commitment of the manager to take up that goal and the best way to increase employee commitment to goal accomplishment is involve them that is employee participation while making the goal and then give them finally the feedback this constant feedback related to their performance and achievement of the goal will enable them to identify any performance gap if at all if at all it was to reach to the final destination appropriately now as we have done evaluation of other theories also this theory also deserves the same and evaluation of goal theory says that it offers a good understanding of goal to the employee and employees are then motivated to successful completion of the goal this theory is capable of improving cost control why because when the goal is clear the path is clear redundancy is less wastage is less quality control and satisfaction level of the workers it enables organization to shape job design programs in a number of areas of work in past two decades after goal setting theory the next theory is reinforcement theory i would say students as a teacher personally this is the most favorite theory that i have read rather i believe in this theory and i also follow the the outcome of this theory rather the premise of this theory the premise of this theory is that students understand this statement behavior is outcome of its consequences now what does this mean you will repeat the behavior if you like the consequences of the same behavior previously so when you did a task as a manager you achieved it and you were rewarded you were appreciated you liked the reward that you got you got a paid holiday with your family outside so you liked the reward and now you are motivated to repeat the behavior again so behavior is an outcome of its consequences this is reinforcement theory given by harvard psychologist b f skinner where he explained that behavior is simply a function of its consequences as i mentioned this theory emphasizes that employees on the job behavior can be altered or modified through suitable and timely use of rewards and punishment if the employee like the reward he will bring in change in his behavior and repeat it if he doesn't like the reward he may not bring in change in the behavior or he may bring in change negatively so depending on what is the expectation from the employee to modify the behavior this theory suggests that we can introduce some rewards and punishment to bring in change or alter the behavior of employee so here example says behavior that gets rewarded is most likely to be repeated while the behavior that gets punished is less likely to be repeated different forms of reinforcement can be used for different behaviors so what are different forms of reinforcement for different behavior positive reinforcement these reinforcement reinforces the desired behavior and the aim of providing such pleasant and rewarding reinforcement is to enhance the chances of desired behavior happening again for example if you are providing a reward or you are offering social recognition giving positive feedback maybe you can praise your employee for certain behavior what can be the certain behavior that he reported on time or he did some extra work or he well executed the task for all these things you will feel that there is a positive reinforcement your employee would be doing things again and again or repeating the behavior again and again as desired by you then there is a negative reinforcement so these 
strengthen the desirable behavior again in this case also we are getting the desirable behavior as in the case of positive reinforcement but now what we are doing we are eliminating the undesirable situation or the task so here an individual acts to avoid or escape something that is not pleasant and this is also called as avoidance learning here the example can be you can avoid a noisy environment if you feel it is disturbing you and is giving you a negative reinforcer and you move to a positive environment so if an employee who gets repeatedly reprimanded by the supervisor for being late in the office what will you do here quick answer students you can answer it to yourself here you would like to avoid it what you would avoid you would like to avoid the reprimand you have got you know you are troubled after listening to that reprimand every time now and then and you want to avoid it you want to escape it so as a result you will be get, giving the desired result what will be the desired behavior rather than coming late to office now you will be on time and why are you on time because you want to avoid avoid the reprimand which was continuously given to you by your supervisor so this is negative reinforcement then comes punishment as a means so this is nothing but the undesired consequence of undesired behavior undesired behavior you are continuously talking on your place of work from 9 to 5 that is an undesired behavior you are stealing something from your place of work that is undesired behavior so thus undesired behavior will lead to undesired consequences and punishment typically follows an undesired behavior punishment is to reinforce the right kind of behavior that we want from the individual so for example when an employee is sternly warned for his underperformance okay then the expectation is that negative outcome that is severe warning any memorandum is also given and that will discourage that person from repeating the undesirable behavior or under performance so we can always give a pink slip we say pink slip is given for students in schools if they do something wrong so that is a punishment or students are made to stand outside the class that is a punishment so that they don't repeat the behavior then comes extinction so this relates to the removal of positive reward where the positive reward will no longer be available to the employee you extinguish it this this gets vanished extinction may involve the suspension of pay rise or increment bonus or praises to the employee because he is not performing as per desired behavior he is not performing that so the idea behind extinction is that any behavior that is not positively reinforced is likely to be discontinued in future so since the purpose of any reinforcement is to make employee learn certain desired behavior and leave certain undesired behavior as quickly as possible the timing of reinforcement then becomes very important so here timings can be categorized into two category one is the continuous reinforcement and the other is the partial reinforcement in continuous reinforcement what happens whatever incidence of desired behavior is there it is continuously reinforced and companies tend to prefer continuous reinforcement for it enables the employee to connect with their behavior with desired reward for example when you give cash reward to sales people for every successful sales deal that they do this is called as for every deal that to do is called as continuous reinforcement and when the reinforcement occurs only sometimes or occurrence of desired behavior is not regularly reinforced it is called as partial reinforcement partial reinforcement is further classified into categories like fixed interval schedule and fixed ratio schedule and two more are there so fixed interval schedule is when employees are rewarded particular time interval is called fixed interval reinforcement like annual bonus quarterly bonus biannual bonus so fixed interval schedule to reinforce their behavior while fixed ratio schedule is when employees are rewarded after specified number of desired behavior or action 
so specified number of desired action like piece rate system etc so number of pieces if he is supposed to make 100 but he has made 120 so this 20 differential pieces come under the ratio which is additional to the desired behavior so fixed ratio schedule is the second reinforcement a partial reinforcement then comes variable interval uh, schedule when employees are rewarded in a random and unpredictable manner. So example is instant reward to employees for good performance at a surprise inspection. So you went for a surprise inspection and you realized as a manager that people are working according to the norms and properly thus you are happy and you give them instant reward. Variable ratio schedule is employees are rewarded after unplanned and random number of desired behaviors. Here it was instant visit. Here number of behaviors are seen. Example rewarding an employee say after 5 to 10 instances of desired actions. So when you have substantial amount of desired actions, now you give your employee good rewards. Now evaluation of reinforcement theory helps us understand how far is it a successful theory. So the results of researches in reinforcement theory aimed at behavior modification have proved to be quite encouraging. Reinforcement programs that reward the target behavior are found to be highly successful in motivating the employees. However, this theory is being criticized for few reasons like this theory overstates the importance of extrinsic motivation for the employees, but in practice employees tend to get more satisfaction through intrinsic factors. Furthermore, negative reinforcement especially extinction is not viewed as a good strategy to motivate the people. If you remove any kind of reward, praise, recognition from the system, it is not going to give good to the organization member. It may discourage undesirable behavior, but it cannot lead to desired action. So thus it may cause ill feeling and hostility amongst the members and it is possible that employees might retaliate against the supervisors. So employees may also tend to continue the undesired behavior once the threat or punishment is withdrawn. So this is also one of the negative sides of this theory. Now let us move on and understand the next theory that is the social cognitive theory. Social cognitive theory says that it was developed by Albert Bandura and here individual behavior in a situation is a function of meaning of that situation to him. Looks tricky, is not it? But this says that how you perceive that situation is how you will behave it. So situation, perception and your behavior that has to be in one line. So people make meaning out of situations through three interrelated concepts. You give always meaning to a situation, isn't it? So personal goals and incentives that will help you give a meaning, sense of self characteristics that will help you give a meaning and perceived behavior options will also give you, trend to give you a meaning to, towards the situation. How? So the theory emphasizes that learning task takes place in social context. Do you do that? Do you learn through observations? Do you see people maybe who are celebrities and you learn from them? You learn from them their hairstyle, you learn from their, their dressing style, their way of speaking or you learn from some prominent political figure how to move ahead and gain win confidence of people around them. So we learn a lot from each other from social environment through observations and the basic assumption of this theory is that th there are reciprocal interactions amongst personal, behavioral, social and environmental factors. So what are these? So they, this theory states that people are motivated to develop a sense of human agency in which individuals are proactively engaged in their own success and development. So sense of agency is something that enables individuals to recognize themselves as related to the world via complex casual chains of network. If you develop this sense of agency then you can assure you can be assured of success and development. As per this theory the process of motivation includes setting goals by the individual, self evaluation of the progress deciding the outcome themselves and the expectation, acting with reference to the values they have 
and social comparison with the other people to obtain information about their own learning, goal achievement and finally self-efficacy, a measure of one's own capability to complete the task and attain the goal. So you have a reference person or social comparison from which you see how far you have reached to the goal achievement. If we evaluate the social cognitive theory, researchers on the social cognitive theory support the fundamental assumption of this theory that is cognitive factors have an effect on the personality development and this in turn affects the performance, productivity and motivation of the employees. So what are the cognitive factors, the psychological factors, the thinking element that any individual possesses and because of that thinking element only you get connected with the society at large. So hence this affects the performance, productivity and motivation of the individuals. So this theory has been criticized for failing in connect all its concepts under one unified principles. So that is something one needs to research on the uh, setting, organizational settings that how far the cognitive, cognitive factors have effect on the personality and other principles they are aligned with each other. Moving on to another theory which is again I would say a very important theory to understand the human insights and the reasons for a particular kind of behavior. So this theory also helps us understand the cause for a particular behavior. Here attribution theory was popularized by Fritz Haider and this theory focuses on the causes that people attribute to the perceived success or failure of their life. So you may think that I will come first in the class, you may feel that I will not qualify for this exam at all, maybe if you are giving any entrance exam, you have a perception of success and failure and this perception of success and failure is because there is a cause behind it as attributed. So this theory attempts to offer explanation for the beliefs individuals have about why they behave in the way they do, why? why they behave, why you behave in a particular manner, there are causes behind it. So a person may attribute his or her failure in a particular task or mission to his or her lack of effort and ability. This can be one cause or to another person's fault, this can be another cause. Here students, you can see this cause can be internal cause and this cause can be external cause isn't it? Here you are attributing to yourself, here you are attributing to the outside individual. Let us understand this theory through the, with the help of this graphic. So when individuals observe behavior, they attempt to determine whether that behavior is internally caused or externally caused. So students let us see whether the cause is attributed to internal cause or whether it is attributed to the external cause. Let us start with first point that is individual behavior. A manager behaves in a particular manner, what is the behavior? He shouts, he shouts at a particular employee and while he is shouting there is an observation and interpretation of this behavior that he shouted at someone, right? Here H and L denote high and low and this interpretation has to give an attribution to a cause. So that means we have to attribute a cause why did he shout. There can be three possible reasons, distinctiveness, consensus and consistency according to attribution theory. Interpretation says that was the behavior of the uh, manager of shouting distinctive, he never shouts, he shouted for the first time, if that is the case then it is high distinctive behavior or is it that yes he has a habit of shouting on everyone every time, so that means the behavior is low distinctive, nothing new, he already does this many a time. When it is high, we attribute to the external cause that my boss shouted at me, it was a highly distinctive behavior and because of this high distinctive behavior, 
there must be something which is bothering him maybe he is not psychologically fit or he has some problem back in mind but when cause is low low distinctiveness is low so that means this is internal it is his natural self he does this many a times earlier also he has done this many a times earlier also so behavior is not distinct attribution of the cause is internal it is his mind body his psychological setup only like that second thing interpretation this is the first interpretation second interpretation can be consensus on the behavior so consensus on the behavior is that did he do did he do the right thing right thing means students that would you also do same what he did in the given situation if consensus is high that he did the right thing he shouted at the manager because manager did something unethical so you are convinced and you have a consensus that yes high consensus i would also do the same in this situation then the cause is attributed again to the external factor like this the previous one he must be in some tough times he must be disturbed that is why he behaved in this manner but if consensus is low consensus is low means no you will not do the same in the given situation if you will not do in the same situation that means there is something internal within him which prompts him to do in a, a behavior in this manner the third interpretation would be consistency in his behavior consistency in behavior means that that is a regular thing that he does with the employees high consistency then it is internal attribute it is his personality type that is the internal attribute even here it is the personality type but if it is not regular that is it is one time or the first time he has shouted if for the first time he has shouted then it is low consistency on his behavior then something is bothering him from external so i believe students by now you have understood the attribution theory how we attribute causes to a particular behavior we have to attribute a cause to a behavior so if your employee steals something if your employee is chatting on phone on regular basis on the job if your employee is not listening to you if employee is not completing the task on time if he is not coming on time they are all behaviors and these behaviors these behaviors need to be interpreted and these interpretation after observation can have three connotation distinctiveness consensus and consistency and in the end we can attribute a cause to their behavior this is what attribution theory says and then further attribution says that distinctiveness does this person behave in this manner in other situations also if that is the case yes then the behavior is low distinct if no then the behavior is highly distinct second interpretation consensus do the person behave in the same manner no then low consensus yes then high consensus and consistency does this person behave in the same manner at other times if yes then high consistency and low then no then low consistency this i have explained earlier in the previous slide so i am just quickly moving ahead to the important part here that if the behavior has observations and interpretations as low distinctive behavior low consensus and high consistency then we attribute internal causes to the behavior so in these three scenarios possibility is higher than your that your personality is the reason maybe personality or your own perception or your own state of mind your own abilities all these things or your own personal experiences these are the reasons behind these this behavior but if the behavior moves on to high distinctive behavior low consensus and low consistency behavior then the cause is to external attribute and external attribute here means that you have some kind of difficulties that you are facing so let us students now give attribution to the causes or give the causes to the various behaviors 
First is the distinctive behavior that is does this person behave in this manner in other situations. If yes, then we have low distinctive behavior. If no, then we have high distinctive behavior. In consensus, the, do other person behave in the same manner? If we are in no consensus, then low. If the answer is no, then we have low consensus. If yes, that is the, the, the person behaves in the same manner, then it is high consensus. For consistency, does this person behave in the same manner at other times also? If yes, the person behaves in the same manner in other times, it is highly consistent behavior. If no, then it is low consistent behavior. The attributes given are when it is low distinctiveness, high, low consensus and high consistency, we have internal attributes. And what are the internal attributes? It can be your perception, it can be your personality, it can be your abilities, your experiences which can prompt you to behave in a particular manner. But on the other hand, when it is high distinctive behavior, high consensus and low consistency, then we say that behavior is because of any external attribution. The external attribution can be some difficulties going on in your life, maybe you are facing challenges or immediate or previous response or you can say some kind of negative or positive experience from the outside world that can make the individual behave in this particular manner. So, eventually students attribution theory helps us to understand whether we have to work on the internal aspect of the individual or whether we have to work on the external aspect of the individual. If it is internal, the individual needs to go for a behavioral modification training programs. If it is external, then we have to see how we can bring in changes in the external environment so that we get right kind of modified behavior. Believe, I hope you remember the behavior was we took an example that the manager shouted at the subordinate. So, whether it was finally because of internal attribute or external attribute that will help and guide the organization member to bring in training programs and motivational policies for such individuals. Let us quickly see the evaluation of attribution theory. It is not a strictly a motivation theory, but it is viewed as a kind of motivation theory for the reason that it helps in understanding how people tend to interpret their successes or failure. So, this is their perceptual thing. And this theory also emphasizes that organizations should first change their belief of employees so as to cause of their success and failure before making changes in motivational tools and strategies. So, this belief can bring in changes eventually leading to motivation. Now, we come on to the last theory of motivation that is control theory which is also called as negative feedback loop theory. It was discussed by Lord and Henges and this theory focused on machine based system. It was then modified to suit the human system of motivation. So, according to this theory, the human action and motivation is based essentially on the negative feedback loop. And this feedback loop comprises of series of inputs and outcomes that typically function in a clear path. This control theory of motivation can facilitate the managers understand why people have goals and why they are motivated to achieve and why these goals should be dynamic. Now, this is a critical factor here that goals are the ones which motivate the individual at the large. So, why people have that goal that is what is to be described through the loop. And this is one of the few theories that talk more about individual self-regulation and external stimuli like goals and incentives for motivation purpose. So, here students we have completed all the process theories and the content theories and concept of motivation. I hope and believe you have understood the content well.
and in case you wish to dig in further into the concept of motivation you can look into this bibliography which I have referred to for this particular course and this bibliography has uh, references for various books which you can refer for having in depth in detail understanding of the concept. So that is all from my side with respect to motivation students, thank you.